The Story of Civilization, Volume 2, The Life of Greece, Part 1, by Will Durant, continued, Cassette 3, Side 1. From the 7th century onward, many famous Greeks, Thales, Pythagoras, Solon, Plato, and Democritus, may serve as examples, visited Egypt and were much impressed by the fullness and antiquity of its culture. Here were no barbarians, but men who had had a mature civilization and highly developed arts 2,000 years before the fall of Troy. You Greeks, said an Egyptian priest to Solon, are mere children, talkative and vain, and knowing nothing of the past. When Hecateus of Miletus boasted to the Egyptian priests that he, he could trace his ancestry through 15 generations to a god, they quietly showed him in their sanctuaries the statues of 345 high priests, each the son of the preceding, making 345 generations since the gods had reigned on earth. From the Egyptian cults of Isis and Osiris, in the belief of Greek scholars like Herodotus and Plutarch, came the Orphic doctrine of a judgment after death and the resurrection ritual of Demeter and Persephone at Eleusis. Probably in Egypt, Thales of Miletus learned geometry, and Rhecus and Theodorus of Samos picked up the art of hollow casting in bronze. In Egypt, the Greeks acquired new skills in pottery, textiles, metalworking, and ivory. There, as well as from the Assyrians, Phoenicians, and Hittites, Greek sculptors took the style of their early statues, flat-faced, slant-eyed, close-fisted, straight-limbed, stiff. In the colonnades of Saqqara and Beni Hassan, as well as in the remains of Mycenaean Greece, Greek architects found part of their inspiration for the fluted column and the Doric style. And as Greece in its youth learned humbly from Egypt, so when it was exhausted it died, one might say, in the arms of Egypt. At Alexandria it merged its philosophies, its rites, and its gods with those of Egypt and Judea in order that they might find a resurrected life in Rome and Christianity. Second only to Egypt's was the influence of Phoenicia. The enterprising merchants of Tyre and Sidon acted like a circulating medium in the transmission of culture and stimulated every Mediterranean region with the sciences, techniques, arts, and cults of Egypt and the Near East. They excelled and perhaps instructed the Greeks in the building of ships. They taught them better methods in metalworking, textiles, and dyes. They played a part with Crete and Asia Minor in passing on to Greece the Semitic form of the alphabet that had been developed in Egypt, Crete, and Syria. Farther east, Babylonia gave to the Greeks its system of weights and measures, its water clock and sundial, its monetary units of obol, mina, and talent, its astronomical principles, instruments, records, and calculations, its sexagesimal system of dividing the year, the circle, and the four right angles that are subtended by a circle at its center, into 360 parts, each of the 360 degrees into 60 minutes, and each of the minutes into 60 seconds. It was presumably his acquaintance with Egyptian and Babylonian astronomy that enabled Thales to predict an eclipse of the sun. Probably from Babylonia came Hesiod's notion of chaos as the origin of all things, and the story of Ishtar and Tammuz is suspiciously like those of Aphrodite and Adonis, Demeter and Persephone. Near the eastern end of the commercial complex that united the classic world lay the final enemy of Greece. In some ways, though few, the civilization of Persia was superior to that of contemporary Hellas. It produced a type of gentleman finer than the Greek in every respect except that of intellectual keenness and education, and a system of imperial administration that easily excelled the clumsy hegemonies of Athens and Sparta, and lacked only the Greek passion for liberty. From Assyria, the Ionian Greeks took a measure of skill in animal statuary, a certain thickness of figure and flatness of drapery in their early sculpture, many decorative motives in friezes and mouldings, and occasionally a style of relief, as in the lovely stela of Aristion. Lydia maintained intimate relations with Ionia, and its brilliant capital Sardis was a clearinghouse for the traffic in goods and ideas between Mesopotamia and the Greek cities on the coast. The necessities of an extensive trade stimulated banking and caused the Lydian government, about 680, to issue a state-guaranteed coinage. This boon to trade was soon imitated and improved by the Greeks and had effects as momentous and interminable as those that came from the introduction of the alphabet. The influence of Phrygia was older and subtler. Its mother goddess, Sibylle, entered directly and deviously into Greek religion, and its orgiastic flute music became that Phrygian mode so popular among the populace and so disturbing to the moralists of Greece. 
From Phrygia, this wild music crossed the Hellespont into Thrace and served the rites of Dionysus. The god of wine was the chief gift of Thrace to Greece, but one Thracian city, Hellenized Abdera, sought to even the balance by giving Greece three philosophers, Leucippus, Democritus, and Protagoras. It was from Thrace that the cult of the Muses passed down into Hellas, and the half-legendary founders of Greek music, Orpheus, Museus, and Thamorus, were Thracian singers and bards. From Thrace we move southward into Macedonia, and our cultural circumvallation of Greece is complete. It is a picturesque land with a soil once rich in minerals, plains fertile in grain and fruit, and mountains disciplining a hardy stock that was destined to conquer Greece. The mountaineers and peasants were of mixed race, predominantly Illyrian and Thracian. Perhaps they were akin to the Dorians who conquered the Peloponnesus. The ruling aristocracy claimed Hellenic lineage from Heracles himself and spoke a dialect of Greek. The earlier capital, Edessa, stood on a vast plateau between the plains that stretched to Epirus and the ranges that reached to the Aegean. Farther east lay Pella, capital to be of Philip and Alexander, and near the sea was Pydna, where the Romans would conquer the conquering Macedonians and win the right to transmit Greek civilization to the Western world. This then was the environment of Greece. Civilizations like Egypt, Crete, and Mesopotamia that gave it those elements of technology, science, and art which it would transform into the brightest picture in history, empires like Persia and Carthage that would feel the challenge of Greek commerce and would unite in a war to crush Greece between them into a harmless vassalage, and in the north warlike hordes recklessly breeding, restlessly marching, who would sooner or later pour down over the mountain barriers and do what the Dorians had done, break through what Cicero was to call the Greek border woven on the barbarian robe, and destroy a civilization that they could not understand. Hardly any of these surrounding nations cared for what to the Greeks was the very essence of life, liberty to be, to think, to speak, and to do. Every one of these peoples except the Phoenicians lived under despots, surrendered their souls to superstition, and had small experience of the stimulus of freedom or the life of reason. That was why the Greeks called them all, too indiscriminately, barbaroi, barbarians, a barbarian was a man content to believe without reason and to live without liberty. In the end, the two conceptions of life, the mysticism of the East and the rationalism of the West, would fight for the body and soul of Greece. Rationalism would win under Pericles, as under Caesar, Leo X, and Frederick, but mysticism would always return. The alternate victories of these complementary philosophies in the vast pendulum of history constitute the essential biography of Western civilization. 2. Argos. Within this circle of nations, little Greece expanded until its progeny peopled nearly every Mediterranean shore. For the gaunt hand that stretched its skeletal fingers southward into the sea was but a small part of the Greece whose history concerns us. In the course of their development, the irrepressible Hellenes spread into every isle of the Aegean, into Crete, Rhodes, and Cyprus, into Egypt, Palestine, Syria, Mesopotamia, and Asia Minor, into the Sea of Marmara and the Black Sea, into the shores and peninsulas of the northern Aegean, into Italy, Gaul, Spain, Sicily, and northern Africa. In all these regions they built city-states, independent and diverse, and yet Greek. They spoke the Greek tongue, worshipped Greek gods, read and wrote Greek literature, contributed to Greek science and philosophy, and practiced democracy in the Greek aristocratic way. They did not leave Greece behind them when they migrated from their motherland. They carried it with them, even the very soil of it, wherever they went. For nearly a thousand years they made the Mediterranean a Greek lake and the center of the world. The most discouraging task faced by the historian of classic civilization is that of weaving into one pattern and story these scattered members of the body of Greece. We shall attempt it by the pleasant method of a tour. With a map at our elbow and no expenditure but of the imagination, we shall pass from city to city of the Greek world and observe in each center the life of the people before the Persian War the modes of economy and government, the activities of scientists and philosophers, the achievements of poetry and the creations of art. The plan has many faults. The geographical sequence will not quite agree with the historical. We shall be leaping from century to century as well as from isle to isle, and we shall find ourselves talking with Thales and Anaximander before listening to Homer and Hesiod. But it will do us no harm to see the irreverent Iliad against its actual background of Ionian skepticism, or to hear Hesiod's doer plaints after visiting the Aeolian colonies from which his harassed father came. 
When at last we reach Athens, we shall know in some measure the rich variety of the civilization that it inherited and which it preserved so bravely at Marathon. If we begin at Argos, where the victorious Dorians established their government, we find ourselves in a scene characteristically Greek, a not too fertile plain, a small and huddled city of little brick and plaster houses, a temple on the Acropolis, an open-air theater on the slope of the hill, a modest palace here and there, narrow alleys and unpaved streets, and in the distance the inviting and merciless sea. For Hellas is composed of mountains and ocean. Majestic scenery is so usual there that the Greeks, though moved and inspired by it, seldom mention it in their books. The winter is wet and cold, the summer hot and dry. Sowing is in our autumn, reaping is in our spring. Rain is a heavenly blessing, and Zeus the rainmaker is god of gods. The rivers are short and shallow, torrents for a winter spell, dry smooth pebbles in the summer heat. There are a hundred cities like Argos in the gamut of Greece, a thousand like it but smaller, each of them jealously sovereign, separated from the rest by Greek pugnacity or dangerous waters or roadless hills. The Argives ascribed the foundation of their city to Pelasgic Argus, the hero with a hundred eyes, and its first flourishing to an Egyptian, Danaeus, who came at the head of a band of Danae and taught the natives to irrigate their fields with wells. Such eponyms are not to be scorned. The Greeks preferred to end with myth that infinite regress which we must end with mystery. Under Temenus, one of the returning Heraclidae, Argos grew into the most powerful city of Greece, bringing Tyrans, Mycenae, and all Argolis under its sway. Towards 680, the government was seized by one of those tyrannoi, or dictators, who for the next two centuries became the fashion in the larger cities of Greece. Presumably Phidon, like his fellow dictators, led the rising merchant class, allied in a passing marriage of convenience with the commoners, against a landowning aristocracy. When Aegina was threatened by Epidaurus and Athens, Phidon went to its rescue and took it for himself. He adopted, probably from the Phoenicians, the Babylonian system of weights and measures, and the Lydian plan of a currency guaranteed by the state. He established his mint on Aegina, and the Aeginetan tortoises, coins marked with the island's symbol, became the first official coinage in continental Greece. Phidon's enlightened despotism opened a period of prosperity that brought many arts to Argolis. In the 6th century, the musicians of Argos were the most famous in Hellas. Lasus of Hermione won high place among the lyric poets of his time and taught his skill to Pindar. The foundations were laid of that Argive school of sculpture which was to give Polycletus and its canon to Greece. Drama found a home here in a theater with 20,000 seats and architects raised a majestic temple to Hera, beloved and especially worshipped by Argos as the goddess bride who renewed her virginity every year. But the degeneration of Phidon's descendants, the nemesis of monarchy, and a long series of wars with Sparta weakened Argos and forced it at last to yield to the Lacedaemonians the ownership of the Peloponnesus. Today it is a quiet town, lost amid its surrounding fields, remembering vaguely the glories of its past and proud that in all its long history it has never been abandoned. 3. Laconia South of Argos and away from the sea rise the peaks of the Parnon Range. They are beautiful, but still more pleasing to the eye is the Eurotus River that runs between them and the taller, darker, snow-tipped range of Taygetus on the west. In that seismic valley lay Homer's hollow Lacedaemon, a plain so guarded by mountains that Sparta, its capital, needed no walls. At its zenith, Sparta, the scattered, was a union of five villages, totaling some 70,000 population. Today it is a hamlet of 4,000 souls, and hardly anything remains, even in the modest museum of the city that once ruled and ruined Greece. 1. The Expansion of Sparta from that natural citadel, the Dorians dominated and enslaved the southern Peloponnesus. To these long-haired northerners, hardened by mountains and habituated to war, there seemed no alternative in life but conquest or slavery. War was their business, by which they made what seemed to them an honest living. The non-Dorian natives, weakened by agriculture and peace, were in obvious need of masters. So the kings of Sparta, who claimed a continuous lineage from the Heraclidae of 1104, first subjected the indigenous population of Laconia, and then attacked Messenia. That land, in the southwestern corner of the Peloponnesus, was relatively level and fertile, and was tilled by Pacific tribes. 
We may read in Pausanias how the Messenian king, Aristodemus, consulted the oracle at Delphi for ways to defeat the Spartans, how Apollo bade him offer in sacrifice to the gods a virgin of his own royal race, how he put to death his own daughter and lost the war. Perhaps he had been mistaken about his daughter. Two generations later the brave Aristomenes led the Messenians in heroic revolt. For nine years their cities bore up under attack and siege, but in the end the Spartans had their way. The Messenians were subjected to an annual tax of half their crops, and thousands of them were led away to join the Helot serfs. The picture that we are to form of Laconian society before Lycurgus has, like some ancient paintings, three levels. Above is a master class of Dorians, living for the most part in Sparta on the produce of fields owned by them in the country and tilled for them by Helots. Socially between, geographically surrounding the masters and the Helots, were the Pereisi, dwellers around. Freemen living in a hundred villages in the mountains or on the outskirts of Laconia, or engaged in trade or industry in the towns, subject to taxation and military service, but having no share in the government and no right of intermarriage with the ruling class. Lowest and most numerous of all were the Helots, so named, according to Strabo, from the town of Helus, whose people had been among the first to be enslaved by the Spartans. By simple conquest of the non-Dorian population, or by importing prisoners of war, Sparta had made Laconia a land of some 224,000 Helots, 120,000 Pereisi, and 32,000 men, women, and children of the citizen class. The Helot had all the liberties of a medieval serf. He could marry as he pleased, breed without forethought, work the land in his own way, and live in a village with his neighbors, undisturbed by the absentee owner of his lot, so long as he remitted regularly to this owner the rental fixed by the government. He was bound to the soil, but neither he nor the land could be sold. In some cases he was a domestic servant in the town. He was expected to attend his master in war, and when called upon to fight for the state. If he fought well, he might receive his freedom. His economic condition was not normally worse than that of the village peasantry in the rest of Greece outside of Attica, or the unskilled laborer in a modern city. He had the consolations of his own dwelling, varied work, and the quiet friendliness of trees and fields. But he was continually subject to martial law and to secret supervision by a secret police, by whom he might at any moment be killed without cause or trial. In Laconia, as elsewhere, the simple paid tribute to the clever. This is a custom with a venerable past and a promising future. In most civilizations this distribution of the goods of life is brought about by the normally peaceful operation of the price system. The clever persuade us to pay more for the less readily duplicable luxuries and services that they offer us than the simple can manage to secure for the more easily replaceable necessaries that they produce. But in Laconia the concentration of wealth was affected by irritatingly visible means and left among the helots a volcanic discontent that in almost every year of Spartan history threatened to upset the state with revolution. 2. Sparta's Golden Age In that dim past before Lycurgus came, Sparta was a Greek city like the rest, and blossomed out in song and art as it would never do after him. Music above all was popular there, and rivaled man's antiquity, for as far back as we can delve, we find the Greeks singing. In Sparta, so frequently at war, music took a martial turn, the strong and simple Doric mode. And not only were other styles discouraged, but any deviation from this Doric style was punishable by law. Even Terpander, though he had quelled the sedition by his songs, was fined by the ephors, and his lyre nailed mute to the wall, because to suit his voice he had dared to add another string to the instrument. And in a later generation Timotheus, who had expanded Terpander's seven strings to eleven, was not allowed to compete at Sparta until the ephors had removed from his lyre the scandalously extra strings. Sparta, like England, had great composers when she imported them. Towards 670, supposedly at the behest of the Delphic Oracle, Terpander was brought in from Lesbos to prepare a contest in choral singing at the festival of the Carnea. Likewise, Thalatus was summoned from Crete about 620, and soon after came Tartius, Alcman, and Palimnestus. Their labors went mostly to composing patriotic music and training choruses to sing it. Music was seldom taught to individual Spartans. As in revolutionary Russia, the communal spirit was so strong that music took a corporate form, and group competed with group in magnificent festivals of song and dance. Such choral singing gave the Spartans another opportunity for discipline and mass formations, for every voice was subject to the leader. At the feast of the Hyacinthia, King Agesilaus sang obediently in the place and time assigned to him by the choral master. 
and at the festival of the Gymnopedia, the whole body of Spartans of every age and sex joined in massive exercises of harmonious dance and antistrophal song. Such occasions must have provided a powerful stimulus and outlet to the patriotic sentiment. Terpander, that is, delighter of men, was one of those brilliant poet-musicians who inaugurated the great age of Lesbos in the generation before Sappho. Tradition ascribed to him the invention of scolia, or drinking songs, and the expansion of the lyre from four to seven strings. But the heptachord, as we have seen, was as old as Minos, and presumably men had sung the glories of wine in the forgotten adolescence of the world. Certainly he made a name for himself at Lesbos as Kitharidos, that is, a composer and singer of musical lyrics. Having killed a man in a brawl, he was exiled, and found it convenient to accept an invitation from Sparta. There, it seems, he lived the remainder of his days, teaching music and training choruses. We are told that he ended his life at a drinking party. While he was singing, perhaps that extra note which he had added at the top of the scale, one of his auditors threw a fig at him, which, entering his mouth and his windpipe, choked him to death in the very ecstasy of song. Tertius continued to Pander's work at Sparta during the Second Mycenaean War. He came from Aphidna, possibly in Lacedaemon, probably in Attica. Certainly the Athenians had an old joke about the Spartans, that when the latter were losing the Second War they were saved by a lame Attic schoolmaster whose songs of battle woke up the dull Spartans and stirred them to victory. Apparently he sang his own songs to the flute in public assembly, seeking to transform martial death into enviable glory. It is a fine thing, says one of his surviving fragments, for a brave man to die in the front rank of those who fight for their country. Let each one, standing squarely on his feet, rooted to the ground and biting his lips, keep firm. Foot to foot, shield to shield, waving plumes mingling and helmets clashing, let the warriors press breast to breast, each sword and spear point meeting in the shock of battle. Tertius, said the Spartan king Leonidas, was an adept in tickling the souls of youth. Alcman sang in the same generation as friend and rival of Tertius, but in a more varied and earthly strain. He came from far off Lydia, and some said that he was a slave. Nevertheless, the Lacedaemonians welcomed him, not having yet learned the Xenalasia, or hatred of foreigners, which was to become part of the Lycurgian code. The later Spartans would have been scandalized at his eulogies of love and food, and his roster of Laconia's noble wines. Tradition ranked him as the grossest eater of antiquity and as an insatiable pursuer of women. One of his songs told how fortunate he was that he had not remained in Sardis, where he might have become an emasculate priest of Sibylle, but had come to Sparta, where he could love in freedom his golden-haired mistress, Megalostrata. He begins for us that dynasty of amorous poets which culminates in Anacreon, and he heads the list of the nine lyric poets chosen by Alexandrian critics as the best of ancient Greece. He could write hymns and paeans as well as songs of wine and love, and the Spartans liked especially the Parthenia, or maiden songs, which he composed for choruses of girls. A fragment now and then reveals that power of imaginative feeling which is the heart of poetry. Asleep lie mountain top and mountain gully, shoulder also and ravine, the creeping things that come from the dark earth, the beasts that lie upon the hillside, the generation of the bees, the monsters in the depths of the purple sea. All lie asleep, and with them the tribes of the winging birds. We may judge from these poets that the Spartans were not always Spartans, and that in the century before Lycurgus they relished poetry and the arts as keenly as any of the Greeks. The choral ode became so closely associated with them that when the Athenian dramatists wrote choral lyrics for their plays they used the Doric dialect, though they wrote the dialogue in the Attic speech. It is hard to say what other arts flourished in Lacedaemon in those halcyon days, for even the Spartans neglected to preserve or record them. Laconian pottery and bronze were famous in the seventh century, and the minor arts produced many refinements for the life of the fortunate few. But this little renaissance was ended by the Mycenaean Wars. The conquered land was divided among the Spartans, and the number of serfs was almost doubled. How could thirty thousand citizens keep in lasting subjection four times their number of Paraisi and seven times their number of Helots? It could be done only by abandoning the pursuit and patronage of the arts and turning every Spartan into a soldier, ready at any moment to suppress rebellion or wage war. The constitution of Lycurgus achieved this end, but at the cost of withdrawing Sparta, in every sense but the political, from the history of civilization. 3. Lycurgus 
Greek historians from Herodotus onward took it for granted that Lycurgus was the author of the Spartan Code, just as they accepted as historical the siege of Troy and the murder of Agamemnon. And as modern scholarship for a century denied the existence of Troy and Agamemnon, so today it hesitates to admit the reality of Lycurgus. The dates assigned to him vary from 900 to 600 B.C., and how could one man take out of his head the most unpleasant and astonishing body of legislation in all history and impose it in a few years not only upon a subject population but even upon a self-willed and warlike ruling class? Nevertheless, it would be presumptuous to reject on such theoretical grounds a tradition accepted by all Greek historians. The seventh century was peculiarly an age of personal legislators. Zeleucus at Locris, circa 660, Draco at Athens, 620, and Charondas at Sicilian Catana, circa 610, not to speak of Josiah's discovery of the Mosaic Code in the Temple at Jerusalem, circa 621. Probably we have in these instances not so much a body of personal legislation as a set of customs harmonized and clarified into specific laws and named for convenience's sake from the man who codified them and in most cases gave them a written form. Lycurgus, however, was believed to have forbidden the writing of his laws. We shall record the tradition while remembering that it has in all likelihood personified and foreshortened a process of change from custom to law that required many authors and many years. According to Herodotus, Lycurgus, uncle and guardian of the Spartan king Caraleus, received from the oracle at Delphi certain retra, or edicts, which were described by some as the laws of Lycurgus themselves, or by others as a divine sanction for the laws that he proposed. Apparently the legislators felt that to alter certain customs or to establish new ones, the safest procedure would be to present their proposals as commands of the god. It was not the first time that a state had laid its foundations in the sky. Tradition further relates that Lycurgus traveled in Crete, admired its institutions, and resolved to introduce some of them into Laconia. The kings and most of the nobles grudgingly accepted his reforms as indispensable to their own security. But a young aristocrat, Alcander, resisted violently and struck out one of the legislator's eyes. Plutarch tells the story with his usual simplicity and charm. Lycurgus, so far from being daunted or discouraged by this accident, stopped short and showed his disfigured face and eye beaten out to his countrymen. They, dismayed and ashamed at the sight, delivered Alcander into his hands to be punished. Lycurgus, having thanked them, dismissed them all, accepting only Alcander, and taking him with him into his house, neither did nor said anything severely to him, but bade Alcander to wait upon him at table. The young man, who was of an ingenuous temper, without murmuring, did as he was commanded, and being thus admitted to live with Lycurgus, he had an opportunity to observe in him, besides his gentleness and calmness of temper, an extraordinary sobriety and an indefatigable industry, and so from being an enemy became one of his most zealous admirers, and told his friends and relations that he was not that morose and ill-natured man they had taken him for, but the one mild and gentle character of the world. Having completed his legislation, Lycurgus, says a probably legendary coda to his story, pledged the citizens not to change the laws till his return. Then he went to Delphi, retired into seclusion, and starved himself to death, thinking it a statesman's duty to make his very death, if possible, an act of service to the state. 4. The Lacedaemonian Constitution if we attempt to specify the reforms of Lycurgus, the tradition becomes contradictory and confused. It is difficult to say which elements of the Spartan Code preceded Lycurgus, which were created by him or his generation, and which were added after him. Plutarch and Polybius assure us that Lycurgus redistributed the land of Laconia into 30,000 equal shares among the citizens. Thucydides implies that there was no such distribution. Perhaps old properties were left untouched, while the newly conquered land was equally divided. Like Cleisthenes of Sicyon and Cleisthenes of Athens, Lycurgus, viz. the authors of the Lycurgian constitution, abolished the kinship organization of Laconian society and replaced it with geographical divisions. In this way, the power of the old families was broken and a wider aristocracy was formed. To prevent the displacement of this landowning oligarchy by such mercantile classes as were gaining leadership in Argos, Sicyon, Corinth, Megara, and Athens, Lycurgus forbade the citizens to engage in industry or trade, 
prohibited the use or importation of silver or gold and decreed that only iron should be used as currency. He was resolved that the Spartans, that is, the landowning citizens, should be left free for government and war. It was a boast of ancient conservatives that the Lycurgian constitution endured so long because the three forms of government, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, were united in it and in such proportions that each element neutralized the others against excess. Sparta's monarchy was really a duarchy, since it had concurrently two kings descending from the invading Heraclids. Possibly this strange institution was a compromise between two related and therefore rival houses, or a device to secure without absolutism the psychological uses of royalty in maintaining social order and national prestige. Their powers were limited. They performed the sacrifices of the state religion, headed the judiciary, and commanded the army in war. In all matters they were subordinate to the Senate, and after Plataea they lost more and more of their authority to the ephors. The aristocratic and predominant element of the Constitution resided in the Senate, or Gerousia, literally and actually a group of old men. Normally, citizens under sixty were considered too immature for its deliberations. Plutarch gives their number as twenty-eight and tells an incredible story of their election. When a vacancy occurred, candidates were required to pass silently and in turn before the assembly, and he who was greeted with the loudest and longest shouts was pronounced elected. Perhaps this was thought to be a realistic and economical abbreviation of the fuller democratic process. We do not know which of the citizens were eligible to such election. Presumably they were the homoioi, or equals, who owned the soil of Laconia, had served in the army, and brought their quota of food to the public mess. The Senate originated legislation, acted as a supreme court in capital crimes, and formulated public policy. The assembly, or appella, was Sparta's concession to democracy. Apparently all male citizens were admitted to it upon reaching the age of thirty. Some eight thousand males were eligible in a population of three hundred seventy-six thousand. It met on each day of the full moon. All matters of great public moment were submitted to it, nor could any law be passed without its consent. Few laws, however, were ever added to the Lycurgian constitution, and these the assembly might accept or reject, but not discuss or amend. It was essentially the old Homeric public meeting, listening in awe to the council of chiefs and elders or to the army commanding kings. Theoretically, sovereignty resided in the appella, but an amendment made to the constitution after Lycurgus empowered the Senate, if it judged that the assembly had decided crookedly, to reverse the decision. When an advanced thinker asked Lycurgus to establish a democracy, Lycurgus replied, Begin, my friend, by setting it up in your own family. Cicero compared the five ephors, that is, overseers, to the Roman tribunes, since they were chosen annually by the assembly, but they corresponded more to the Roman consuls, as wielding an administrative power checked only by the protests of the Senate. The ephorate existed before Lycurgus, and yet is not mentioned in such reports of his legislation as have reached us. By the middle of the sixth century, the ephors had become equal in authority to the kings. After the Persian War, they were practically supreme. They received embassies, decided disputes at law, commanded the armies, and directed, absolved, or punished the kings. The enforcement of the government's decrees was entrusted to the army and the police. It was the custom of the ephors to arm certain of the younger Spartans as a special and secret police, the cryptia, with the right to spy upon the people, and in the case of Helots, to kill at their discretion. This institution was used at unexpected times, even to do away with Helots who, though they had served the state bravely in war, were feared by the masters as able and therefore dangerous men. After eight years of the Peloponnesian War, says the impartial Thucydides, the Helots were divided by a proclamation to pick out those of their number who claimed to have most distinguished themselves against the enemy, in order that they might receive their freedom, the object being to test them, as it was thought that the first to claim their freedom would be the most high-spirited and the most apt to rebel. As many as two thousand were selected accordingly, who crowned themselves and went round the temples, rejoicing in their new freedom. The Spartans, however, soon afterwards did away with them, and no one ever knew how each of them perished. The power and pride of Sparta was above all in its army, for in the courage, discipline, and skill of these troops it found its security and its ideal. Every citizen was trained for war, and was liable to military service from his twentieth to his sixtieth year. Out of this severe training came the hoplites of Sparta, those close-set companies of heavy-armed, spear-hurling citizen infantry that were the terror even of the Athenians, and remained practically undefeated until Epaminondas overcame them at Leuctra. 
Around this army, Sparta formed its moral code. To be good was to be strong and brave. To die in battle was the highest honor and happiness. To survive defeat was a disgrace that even the soldier's mother could hardly forgive. Return with your shield or on it, was the Spartan mother's farewell to her soldier son. Flight with the heavy shield was impossible. 5. The Spartan Code To train men to an ideal so unwelcome to the flesh, it was necessary to take them at birth and form them by the most rigorous discipline. The first step was a ruthless eugenics. Not only must every child face the father's right to infanticide, but it must also be brought before a state council of inspectors, and any child that appeared defective was thrown from a cliff of Mount Taygetus to die on the jagged rocks below. A further elimination probably resulted from the Spartan habit of inuring their infants to discomfort and exposure. Men and women were warned to consider the health and character of those whom they thought of marrying. Even a king, Archidamus, was fined for marrying a diminutive wife. Husbands were encouraged to lend their wives to exceptional men so that fine children might be multiplied. Husbands disabled by age or illness were expected to invite young men to help them breed a vigorous family. Lycurgus, says Plutarch, ridiculed jealousy and sexual monopoly and called it absurd that people should be so solicitous for their dogs and horses as to exert interest and pay money to procure fine breeding and yet keep their wives shut up to be made mothers only by themselves who might be foolish and firm or diseased. In the general opinion of antiquity, the Spartan males were stronger and handsomer their women healthier and lovelier than the other Greeks. Probably more of this result was due to training than to eugenic birth. Thucydides makes King Archidamus say, There is little difference, at birth presumably, between man and man, but the superiority lies with him who is reared in the severest school. At the age of seven, the Spartan boy was taken from his family and brought up by the state. He was enrolled in what was at once a military regiment and a scholastic class under a Pidominos, or manager of boys. In each class, the ablest and bravest boy was made captain. The rest were instructed to obey him, to submit to the punishments he might impose upon them, and to strive to match or better him in achievement and discipline. The aim was not, as at Athens, athletic form and skill, but martial courage and worth. Games were played in the nude under the eyes of elders and lovers of either sex. The older men made it their concern to provoke quarrels among the boys, individually and in groups, so that vigor and fortitude might be tested and trained, and any moment of cowardice brought many days of disgrace. To bear pain, hardship, and misfortune silently was required of all. Every year at the altar of Artemis Orthia, some chosen youths were scourged till their blood stained the stones. At twelve the boy was deprived of underclothing and was allowed but one garment throughout the year. He did not bathe frequently like the lads of Athens, for water and unguents made the body soft, while cold air and clean soil made it hard and resistant. Winter and summer he slept in the open, on a bed of rushes broken from the Eurotus's banks. Until he was thirty he lived with his company in barracks, and knew none of the comforts of home. He was taught reading and writing, but barely enough to make him literate. Books found few buyers in Sparta, and it was easy to keep up with the publishers. Lycurgus, said Plutarch, wished children to learn his laws not by writing but by oral transmission and youthful practice under careful guidance and example. It was safer, he thought, to make men good by unconscious habituation than to rely upon theoretical persuasion. A proper education would be the best government. But such education would have to be moral rather than mental. Character was more important than intellect. The young Spartan was trained to sobriety, and some helots were compelled to drink to excess in order that the youth might see how foolish drunkenness can be. He was taught in preparation for war to forage in the fields and find his own food or starve. To steal in such cases was permissible, but to be detected was a crime punishable by flogging. If he behaved well, he was allowed to attend the public mess of the citizens, and was expected to listen carefully there so that he might become acquainted with the problems of the state and learn the art of genial conversation. At the age of thirty, if he had survived with honor the hardships of youth, he was admitted to the full rights and responsibilities of a citizen, and sat down to dine with his elders. The girl, though left to be brought up at home, was also subject to regulation by the state. She was to engage in vigorous games, running, wrestling, throwing the quoit, casting the dart, in order that she might become strong and healthy for easy and perfect motherhood. She should go naked in public dances and processions, even in the presence of young men, so that she might be stimulated to proper care of her body and her defects might be discovered and removed. Nor was there anything shameful in the nakedness of the young women, says the highly moral Plutarch. Modesty attended them and all wantonness was excluded. 
While they danced, they sang songs of praise for those that had been brave in war and heaped contumely upon those that had given way. Mental education was not wasted upon the Spartan girl. As to love, the young man was permitted to indulge in it without prejudice of gender. Nearly every lad had a lover among the older men. From this lover he expected further education, and in return he offered affection and obedience. Often this exchange grew into a passionate friendship that stimulated both youth and man to bravery in war. Young men were allowed considerable freedom before marriage, so that prostitution was rare, and Hatairai here found no encouragement. In all of Lacedaemon we hear of only one temple to Aphrodite, and there the goddess was represented as veiled, armed with a sword and bearing fetters on her feet, as if to symbolize the foolishness of marrying for love, the subordination of love to war, and the strict control of marriage by the state. The state specified the best age of marriage as thirty for men and twenty for women. Celibacy in Sparta was a crime. Bachelors were excluded from the franchise and from the sight of public processions in which young men and women danced in the nude. According to Plutarch, the bachelors themselves were compelled to march in public, naked even in winter, singing a song to the effect that they were justly suffering this punishment for having disobeyed the laws. Persistent avoiders of marriage might be set upon at any time in the streets by groups of women and be severely handled. Those who married and had no children were only less completely disgraced, and it was understood that men who were not fathers were not entitled to the respect that the youth of Sparta religiously paid to their elders. Marriages were usually arranged by the parents, without purchase, but after this agreement the bridegroom was expected to carry off the bride by force, and she was expected to resist. The word for marriage was harpadzine, to seize. If such arrangements left some adults still unmarried, several men might be pushed into a dark room with an equal number of girls and be left to pick their mates in the darkness. The Spartans thought that such choosing would not be blinder than love. It was usual for the bride to stay with her parents for a while. The bridegroom remained in his barracks and visited his wife only clandestinely. In this relation, says Plutarch, they lived a long time, insomuch that they sometimes had children by their wives before they even saw their faces by daylight. When they were ready for parentage, custom allowed them to set up a home. Love came after marriage rather than before, and marital affection appears to have been as strong in Sparta as in any other civilization. The Spartans boasted that there was no adultery among them, and they may have been right, for there was much freedom before marriage, and many husbands could be persuaded to share their wives, especially with brothers. Divorce was rare. The Spartan general Lysander was punished because he left his wife and wished to marry a prettier one. All in all, the position of woman was better in Sparta than in any other Greek community. There, more than elsewhere, she preserved her high Homeric status and the privileges that survived from an early matrilinear society. Spartan women, says Plutarch, were bold and masculine, overbearing to their husbands, and speaking openly even on the most important subjects. They could inherit and bequeath property, and in the course of time, so great was their influence over men, nearly half the real wealth of Sparta was in their hands. They lived a life of luxury and liberty at home while the men bore the brunt of frequent war or dined on simple fare in the public mess. For every Spartan male, by a characteristic ordinance of the Constitution, was required from his thirtieth to his sixtieth year to eat his main meal daily in a public dining hall, where the food was simple in quality and slightly but deliberately inadequate in amount. In this way, says Plutarch, the legislator thought to harden them to the privations of war and to keep them from the degeneration of peace. They should not spend their lives at home, laid on costly couches at splendid tables, delivering themselves up to the hands of their tradesmen and cooks, to fatten them in corners like greedy brutes, and to ruin not their minds only, but their very bodies, which, enfeebled by indulgence and excess, would stand in need of long sleep, warm bathing, freedom from work, and in a word of as much care and attendance as if they were continually sick. To supply the food for this public meal, each citizen was required to contribute to his dining club, periodically stated quantities of corn and other provisions. If he failed in this, his citizenship was forfeited. Normally, in the earlier centuries of the Code, the simplicity and asceticism to which Spartan youth was trained persisted into later years. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.